longer to talk. Yeah. Okay. You ready, Andre? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. works. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, firstly, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I have no idea how many captains we've been to, um, but uh, each one and every one seems to come with some uh, new, uh, exciting challenges. Uh, so good to see so many of you. I look around the room and I feel old because I've worked, realized I've worked with some people in this room for 30 odd years. <clears throat> um, anyway, so I was asked to give a sort of generic in, um, uh, in, introduction to this essential features topic. Um, before I start, it isn't just for those of you who feel like me in the morning after um, going out and today, it is not 2017, contrary to my um, slide. Um, <laughs> it may feel like that, but it's, it's actually 2019. Um, and the other thing I have to say is that um, in order to be totally fair to what I said yesterday, I unders uh, beer this evening or tomorrow, depending on how things go, because in fact, the big problem that I shouted about yesterday was solved. I think you sent me an email at like 1.30 in the morning. Um, so obviously he takes these things extremely seriously. Um, and so uh, I haven't actually tried it out in a real problem, but at least it worked for the example. So thank you, Anders. Okay, so um, let's see if I can get things to work. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about features. Let's see if this thing actually works. Does it work? No, of course it doesn't work. Should it work? Oh, okay. Oh, does this work? Okay, I'm not gonna point at anybody. Um, so, um, why is that actually not changing on the screen, guys? Doesn't, oh, intriguing. Ha, huh, that's gonna be adventure. Okay, so I can't actually see anything. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, we're good. Um, so, the history of stock assessment, uh, at least the quantitative versions thereof go back uh, in some sense, the early 1920s, uh, where the concepts behind Schaefer models came into being. Uh, but most of us, thankfully, don't remember 1922 terribly much and, and Graham, etc. cetera. Um, stock assessment, though, has evolved considerably over the last... By the way, you are supposed to be paying attention to the pictures because there will be a quiz at the end, right? Um, some, uh, there's, some, there's some sort of low-hanging fruit here. Uh, and then there's some pretty tough ones. I'm not sure anyone even remembers who the gent in the bottom right corner is. I'm assuming that Rick does. He's looking very confused. Sorry? Bottom left, sorry, yeah, that, whatever that is. My right, your left. Um, so assessment has evolved over time, uh, starting with methods that are fundamentally fairly simple, production models, VPAs, uh, moving into the world of tuned VPAs, uh, integrated analysis, uh, particularly in terms of age-structured models, and then we moved into size-structured models, and then we're you know, starting to head into the world of multi-species assessments, and ultimately we'll all be drinking Pepsi, which means we've sort of evolved to the, the, the final state of evolution. Um, so the other thing I have to introduce is 1977. Um, so uh, you guys were all very rude yesterday about Fortran. Uh, for those who've never seen Fortran, there it is. Uh, but I thought while I was sort of thinking about 1977, uh, I, it was imperative that I reminded you of some of the great things that happened in 1977. So uh, the Apple II computer, um, does that ring any bells? I remember playing Pac-Man on an Apple II back in the day. Um, my first model on an Apple II. Uh, I think it had all of 3K of memory. That was so awesome when you got to 4K and they actually gave you a hard drive. That came with a, that's a, probably a 10K hard drive. Uh, which was really big in, well, 1980s when I was using them. And then, of course, Star Wars, Saturday Night Fever. And we try to forget about this. Um, how many people actually had uh, bell bottoms? Put up your hands. Bruce, come on. You must have had bell bottoms. John had bell. So there are good things in 1977, um, but clearly the best of all is Fortran 77. Okay, so let's actually move into some of the more meat. Um, this paper really... Um, 
When I, was a, when I started as a graduate student uh, a while ago now, uh, I was told by my advisor that there's this thing called a library uh, and there's a journal called the Canadian Journal and your mission is to read it. Um, and when you've read it, come back and do your thesis. Um, we didn't have grad classes, we had libraries. Um, and this paper probably was the one that uh, really impacted my career to the greatest extent. I mean, for most of us, um, if you've never read this paper, there is so much in this paper that we're still in some sense following up on and, and building on. Um, it was the, the first paper in, in the fisheries literature that really introduced state space models, uh, even though at the time the actual me mechanics, the math wasn't a proper state space model and, and dare I say we're probably still there today for many of our models. Um, and in particular, it, it, it sort of introduced the idea of separating the model of the population dynamics and the model of the observation process. So uh, for those of you who put their hand up about remembering bell bottoms, uh, you will remember VPAs where we assume in general that the catch at age is measured with no error or negligible error. Uh, for those who've ever aged something, you probably wouldn't have run that model very often. Um, and then many of you probably will not even remember what a process error estimator is for a production model, which essentially assumes that CPUE is measured with no error. So there was really no concept of separating the population dynamics model from the observation model. And that really um, is fundamental to all the models that we are seeing uh, in, this, in this meeting. So a really good paper um, and, and one that certainly influenced me. Um, so moving on to where are we today? Um, arguably, we, we can do what Fernie and Archibald did back in 1982. We can do it a lot faster. Uh, but in fact, fundamentally, most of the assumptions that we are dealing with today in, in the sort of general packages are much the same as the, um, can you see my mouse? No, of course you can't. Oh, there's my mouse. Are much the same as the uh, assumptions that really came out in, in the 1982 paper. So, uh, our models are what I would call single species, single stock. So we assume a single homogeneous population uh, generally. Uh, no stock structure, um, hopefully no geneticists in the audience to contradict that. Um, our models tend to be age structured. Uh, the first size structured integrated analysis type models came out in the 1990s. Uh, to some extent that's computational. Uh, to another extent is that size structured models have never been a big thing in Europe where a lot of the impetus for uh, a lot of these models came from. Um, we now commonly have multiple fisheries, although some of the models, I think SAM still really is a single fleet model fundamentally. Uh, we have multiple surveys, multiple uh, uh, fisheries uh, modeled as what I call areas as fleets, although I probably will call them fleets as areas before I'm done because I can never remember who I am let alone what the method is. I'll touch on that in the next slide. And then importantly, we fit into more and more data sets. So I guess the first models I remember fitting to, we had an index and we had some catch proportion, catch at age data in those days. Uh, then we moved to catch proportion data, then we brought in size data, then we brought in tagging data, then we brought in composition data, then blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and we'll talk uh, before I'm finished about a data set that we'll hear more about today, but I think is gonna revolutionize what we're doing. Technical stuff, uh, we thought of, uh, okay, here we're gonna, this part of this is history and admitting your failures and, and what you've learned. Um, so who had never heard of random effects, say, before 10 years ago? Put up your hands. Right, I'm not gonna ask how many of you never heard of random, eh, 10 to 15, whatever. Um, we just didn't really know what random effects were. I remember talking to John Schnoody, hint, he's on the slide before, okay? Hope you saw him there. And he was saying, you know, obviously we do this random effects and you're going, yeah, that's really cool. What is that all about? So we didn't really conceive that we didn't know what we were doing um, until it was pointed out that, uh, uh, for me, it was a paper by Perry de Valpine about uh, 2002, 2003, that really pointed out that our models really aren't uh, consistent in the sense of an infinite amount of data will not lead to the correct answer. Um, and that's sort of a bad thing from a statistician's point of view. Um, is that correct? You, you want a consistent estimator generally? Hans is nodding, so clearly I know what I'm talking about occasionally. Um, we estimate uncertainty and we got a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and then we have to deal with data weighting. 
but I'm not going to talk much about that. So areas as fleets. Um, what is areas as fleets? Essentially, uh, when we're our models, the models we're going to talk about, you can divide into two categories. The first essentially models the N matrix. I haven't got a lot of equations. I feel sort of inadequate not having equations in my talk. Um, we, so N here is numbers by year, age, and sex. Uh, in this case, we're essentially looking at how, what, if you've got a fishery in two, two fisheries in different areas and they give you different length compositions, is that because selectivity is different? And that is the assumption underlying areas as fleets. Basically, we're saying we've got a bog pub and there is a, this is actually a fisheries model, right? All, this is, in fact, stock synthesis. Um, that, that's the model underlying stock synthesis. All fish are in a big bath, um, and we've got different soap uh, containers when we pull our fish out of the... Um, that's unfair. You've got spatial structure as well. Um, uh, you, when, you, when you take your water out of the bath. Um, on the other hand, the models I think we're going to be using in the next generation are truly spatial models, where we... Uh, mathematically, I'm a mathematician, so it's really easy to do. Somebody else has to code up the model. Uh, all I had to do was add uh, an A subscript, which apparently I forgot to do. Um, so the NYSA would have a big capital A for area. And we will model differences in length composition, age composition spatially, not based on the fact that selectivity is different spatially, but because the underlying population is itself different. And that, to my mind, is one of the really important discussion points we need to have, which is how, how do we design a model that can handle spatial structure, recognizing that not every stock assessment is going to be able to support a 20 area uh, size and age structured population. We need scalability. And based on our discussions yesterday, we really need to think about what I call the super model, the model that rules them all, and it's not stock synthesis um, for now. Okay, um, so just to reinforce that point, uh, everyone know who this guy is, the inventor of AIC? That's not Ike Iki, that is? Sorry? Very good, what's his first name? Ah, students today. William of Ockham, uh, 1285 to, I think, 1347, but there's always observation error when it comes to uh, 14th century aging. So he was a monk. So this is one of the great things about science today. You can be female and you don't have to be a monk. Neither of those sound, it doesn't sound like a great constraint to be an academic in the 14th century. And you've got to be bald. They, they cut your head off, hair off. Um, so... The point here really is to emphasize the importance of why we want complicated assessments, right? And that we still need to be able to create assessment frameworks that we can apply in a scalable way across um, jurisdictions, across uh, the types of uh, systems we're working with, taking into account, of course, the trade-off between complexity and hopefully lesser bias, more parameters, higher variance, and maybe as, as people use computers, there's a whole new dimension which is called the probability of programming error. The more complicated your model is, the more chance that you've actually got the wrong results. I, I want to throw in something that just highlights a point Gemery made yesterday, and that is the fact that when we, most of us now use our stock assessments not just to estimate status, but to calculate harvest-related quantities. And as, as Gemery mentioned, um, one of the things about a lot of our models is that they are not, they don't have a lot of generality at the level of specifying harvest uh, uh, options. And, and uh, uh, echoing Gemery's point, thanking um, uh, Rick for in, uh, introducing the Australian control rule in, well, the, sorry, one of the Australian control rules into stock synthesis, but recognizing that that's a general challenge we all have to face. If we want a general package, we need to not just create something that works for West Coast groundfish, but for many jurisdictions. And sadly, our harvest specifications is one of the most particularly complicated uh, parts of our models that are so case and jurisdiction specific. So a real challenge there. Um, ultimately, we're after a modeling framework that allows us to, to find the sweet spot, uh, the sweet spot between of model complexity, uh, where we're always trading off bias. In other words, our model is too simple. Okay, all models are too simple. Some models are really, really too simple. 
uh, versus trying to estimate too many parameters. Uh, most of us have discovered the, uh, the, the empirical test for over-parameterized models. We call them Hessian positive definite. You might have encountered it. Or the great thing about TMB is it hides that message and just gives you a NAN on your variance parameters. And that feels so much more scientific than nah, 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 your model didn't converge, um, although it's there as well. So uh, we really do need it as we're thinking about our, our next gen models, we really need to think about how we're going to deal with model selection, uh, being able to scale between different uh, types of models. So what am I going to talk about? Well, I've got um, six challenges that uh, we may or may not pick up as we move through the rest of today. Um, this is actually a picture from one of the CAPMs. Uh, Mark is there. Can anyone remember which one this was? Who was there? Sa yeah, it's San Diego, so we can eliminate it down to two. I think, sorry? Was it last fall? You're there. Okay. So by process that Maya is in the audience, it is the, uh, which one was that? Growth? Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> okay, so what am I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out a whole bunch of other topics just to make sure that we got lots to talk about, but there are six things I really want to emphasize uh, today. And so here's another picture, and Maya, you're in that one as well. This is a little worrying. <laughs> um, so uh, here are my six challenges for the, uh, from a design point of view. Um, stocks and species, um, data rich to data poor, age length models, and I know Rick McGarvey is going to talk a bit about those, uh, mark recapture data, and that's not sticking a, a tag into Mark Maunder, but it does sound like an amusing thing to do, um, random effects and data weighting, um, and simulation and management strategy evaluation. I'm going to pick up a whole bunch of other things that I didn't think I had the time for as I get to the end, but let's see how far we get with this. So. Stock structure is one of those things we've really not dealt with very well. Um, we tend to draw lines on maps and uh, assume that whatever is north of the line is stock one, what is south of the line is stock two, um, and uh, assume es essentially a single uh, spawning population, a single density dependence function, um, in principle, in, in models like uh, stock synthesis, you can have a single stock, and maybe I should define what a stock is, although if you have, I've always discovered, it's like the joke about the mathematician, the biologist, and the physicist come into a bar. Uh, if you want to, the, the, the biological equivalent is one geneticist, two geneticists, and three geneticists come into a bar, and you ask them what a stock is, because you always get about five answers from that particular discussion. Um, so when I'm talking about stock structure, I'm talking about um, some form of demographic independence uh, through uh, breeding uh, generally. Um, however, you can have more complicated stock structures where you have a single breeding population, density dependence may be at the population level, but there's actually spatial variation in biological parameters such as growth or uh, in particular. Um, some of the packages do allow for multiple populations. So Castle uh, is one. Uh, I don't know how many multi-stock assessments are done using Castle, but certainly the, the Hokey or Blue Grenadier assessment has been done using a multi-stock version for probably two decades now, I guess. Um, so these models do exist. Uh, the other advantage of stock models is it allows us to share parameters between stocks. So often when you're doing a stock assessment, you've got uh, a number of areas, some of which are data rich and some of which are data poor, and it, it, there's, a, there's a need in some sense to be able to share uh, information uh, among areas or among stocks to, to maximize the information content. And in, in previous papers, I've referred to that as the, the Robin Hood approach, stealing from the data rich and giving to the data poor. Um, although there's no violence unlike Robin Hood. Um, so uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so just some just examples that spatial structure really does matter. Um, I'm trying to remember what these are. Uh, what are they? Uh, the first, the top row is a, um, a stock assessment for uh, school shock or uh, southern Australia, which I still think is in Fortran. Is that right, Robin? Oh, apparently I'm out of date. 
Thank you, Robin. I didn't need that. Uh, agreement is what I'm really after, by the way. Um, and uh, this is actually a stock synthesis assessment of canary rockfish. I think it's not the most recent one, uh, showing that um, at, a, at, a, at a total population uh, level, this is over multiple spatial strata, uh, you've got very similar results, but when you disaggregate them spatially, uh, there are quite substantial differences in trends. So this is a single biological stock inside a model with multiple spatial areas um, uh, a structure. So there's a lot of challenges if we do move to truly spatially structured models. So uh, most of what we think about are, uh, are, are essentially how animals move. Uh, but once we move to spatial structure, we need to think about where is density dependence operating. Uh, we, we, in a single bathtub model, density dependence is at the thing level, whatever the, the thing is. But once we move to spatially structured population models, we can be much more precise about how density dependence operates. So in some of the whale stock assessments, I know I'm not supposed to talk about whales in a fish meeting, uh, we're, but we're much clearer that density dependence occurs, for example, on the feeding grounds rather than uh, when you're reproducing. And of course, whales don't have spawning biomass, just for those who don't know these things. Um, so, uh, so you've got multiple stocks, multiple species, density dependence considerations. In some cases, you'll have data over multiple biological stocks. Um, for example, the Hokey assessment I referred to, one of the surveys surveys both stocks at the same time. So one of the challenges there is how to analyze those data. The sort of temptation is to deconstruct the survey and say, well, this is stock one and that's stock two. That's not a clever thing to do. Um, Things that we haven't really dealt with very much is density dependent movement, density dependent distribution, um, uh, sex specific distributions of rec uh, recruits, uh, bringing in data on stock mixing. So for those who, uh, for example, in the salmon world, there's an enormous amount of data on stock mixing that if you were doing a stock assessment, you could bring into the likelihood function. And of course, ability to place priors on, on various things. So spatial structure itself, uh, building spatial models, as, as was pointed out earlier, was a focus for one of the last, the last CAPM. Uh, there are a lot of archetypes for how we can have spatial movement. I'm not going to get into those. Uh, but I do want to emphasize the one that I think is uh, starting to make me most nervous, and that are climbs. So we tend to think of stocks as groups of animals that overlap and move around. But in a genetic sense, often we've got is just a this end is different from that end, and there's something going on in the middle. And, and I don't think anyone has really come up with an effective way to model uh, a cline, although it's, it's pretty common in many of the species I see. Uh, reference points. Uh, what is a reference point when you've got multiple stocks and movement and all that kind of stuff? I think, Rick, you're going to talk about that a little bit, maybe? Ah, okay. So well, that, that wrecks my day. Um, I was hoping to find the answer. Um, and then modeling of movement, I think uh, when we look at the models we've got, uh, there, there's quite a lot of options that I don't think we've really built on. So stealing from the data rich and moving to the data poor. Um, I'm not a great fan of data poor assessment methods. Uh, if Malcolm was here, he would agree with me, but apparently he hasn't sobered up from last night. So that, sorry? <laughs> Hallelujah, he is in the light. In the light, the <laughs> you'd agree with me, right? Anyway, um, you're not allowed to reply to that. Um, so there's a lot of data poor assessment methods. Uh, most of them I use in my class as an example of things not to do because they're quite patently wrong. Um, I am of the belief that we should use our models and scale them to the data that we have uh, rather than trying to, oh, Chantel is agreeing with me. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, we want scalable models. We want to be able to apply the same modeling framework in data rich and data poor cases, if nothing else, to understand the consequences of having fewer data given the same population dynamics. Um, uh, right now, we've got some very different paradigms between data rich and, and data poor and what I call data free methods. So anything that just uses catches uh, statistically, it is in fact data free and we shouldn't call it a catch only method because there's no likelihood function. Therefore, there is no data. Um, but I do think this is something we'll pick up as we uh, go through the day. 
in, I think I've covered the first point. We want scalable models, models that can uh, uh, have a continuity of, of structure. We keep the same model. We essentially change the number of parameters. We may move to a Bayesian framework. Um, Bayesian here is, is really important, and I think it's probably the, the paradigm we really want to uh, focus on with data poor methods. The number of times that I've seen the results of a data poor assessment imply that you have more precision than a data rich method because you estimate fewer parameters. For those who do st are statisticians, that is an anathema, right? The idea is the more data you have, the more precise you have, you are. So as we change our models, basically we set the bar lower, we get this perception of, of increased precision because we've set the bar lower. Um, that's really important in the world we live in today where people actually do care about our measures of uncertainty, particularly in the US where the size of the buffers that we use depends on the uncertainty. So if you underestimate uncertainty, you're gonna get your buffers wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, I, the whole data rich, data poor thing. Uh, really good paper that just came out, just a quick adver uh, advert. Uh, I was hoping that Sean would be here. I've never met Sam Johnson. Sam here? No, apparently not. Um, read this paper, it's good. Um, in fact, I, I think it's really awesome, but I don't have time to get into it. Okay, um, age length models. Uh, for most of the models that we're gonna hear about today, they are age structured. I mean, that's sort of the basis for a lot of our integrated models, and a lot of models haven't really moved from that. There are size-structured models. Uh, size-structured models um, uh, are, are used mainly for invertebrates. Um, uh, they can be fit, they, they're, they're used essentially when the only data we got is length information. Um, one of the things about uh, age models is we're now pretty good at fitting to length data. Obviously, if you've got a size-structured model, you can't fit to age data. Um, I think we need to think about very seriously about age length models. So models that simultaneously keep track of the age structure and the size structure of populations. Um, there are some obvious issues there about uh, complexity. Um, so your model gets really complicated really quickly. Um, and that's where we'll probably hear a little bit about partitions, uh, which sounds like something that you're dividing a country up, but hopefully you're dividing a population up. So I think age length models are, are part of the future. My lab has been involved in developing some of those. Uh, you can, with some good programming, make them, I, I guess you'd say that the speed is slow as opposed to dismal. Um, uh, and that certainly has been a problem with age size models in the past. But in reality, uh, age size models are, are what we're gonna need as we're concerned about things like length specific fishing mortality rates, if they're big enough. Um, what else was I going to say here? Um, tagging, uh, at least in, say, stock synthesis and, and a lot of the models, uh, is really challenging if you're using an age-based model, because essentially you have to take a tag and you have to create its age in order to propagate it through the model. Uh, it's much more natural to uh, model tagging data unless you somehow age the fish at tagging, which usually is lethal, so they not get, don't get recaptured. Um, the, the size structure models provide a much more, much more natural way to model tagging information. And so age size models are, 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 are a natural extension of the models we, we tend to use in that regard. Some of the, set, some of the deadly sins, I'm not gonna speak much about them. We spent a whole meeting trying to talk about them. Um, so the, 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 I, I've only got three deadly, uh, three deadly sins? Yeah, three deadly sins. Um, they're all deadly. Um, it turns out what we, I mean, when I, I, remember, I remember first seeing the sort of uh, work that Dave Fournier did with the original uh, age structured models. Uh, all of us used to fit those models. Does anyone remember putting the effective sample size to 100? Does that ring a bell? And if it was really good, it was 50. Oh, sorry, if it was 200 and maybe it was 50, and then we just ran the model. And, and then we discovered that if you change 50 to 100, it actually made a difference. Um, and so it took us quite a while to even realize there was a problem in terms of weighting data, particularly composition data. Um, we now have quite a number of what I call ad hoc methods to tune our, um, our, our effective sample sizes for our composition data. 
uh, we've, we're starting to get there with Sigma R as well. We've got some ad hoc methods for uh, the Sigma R here being the variance of the random effects generally in terms of recruitment. Uh, but as we, as we move into more sophisticated models, any form of process error, right? So process error in selectivity, process error in natural mortality, process error in whatever you, whatever you want. Uh, setting those variances uh, is challenging and can be influential. Um, and it's all to do with the fact that we're damn ignorant about um, uh, random effects and, and how to deal with them properly. Um, the solution, it's there. We've actually had the solution for decades. If you go Bayesian, you can do it. Um, although Gemery did mention that if you, you have to be slightly more sort of patient, something that I am definitely not. Was it six weeks, did you say, Gemery? And it didn't converge. And counting. And counting. Um, so for those of you who go to stock assessment meetings, uh, you're standing up there presenting Jim and Ellie's writing notes on what you've done. And you say, Jim, I'll get back to you. Just wait seven weeks and I will have the results for you, maybe. Okay, so Bayesian methods analytically will solve this problem. Uh, in reality, they're really challenging. Um, you know, I, I think that whatever we do, uh, we need to keep the Bayesian framework and keep the Frequentist framework going in parallel. They have different strengths, different weaknesses, but I see uh, TMB or one of its friends uh, as the future. And in fact, I've almost stopped teaching ADMB, as heretical as that may seem. Um, if you don't know TMB as a grad student today, uh, I won't say you're unemployable, but you're getting closer and closer to it. So uh, let's, let's, let's make the call. We're going to leave ADMB behind when we leave this meeting. Now, you might. I'm not, obviously not going to, but philosophically, let, let's do that. Um, Never, never over my dead body, over your dead body. Forget my dead body. I don't like, that's a really bad expression, over my dead body. That sounds like it's really unfortunate. So over your dead body. Um, I think Robin Thompson's going to talk about close kin genetics. Um, sorry? Oh, okay. More people are going to talk. Everyone's going to talk about close kin genetics. Um, so close kin genetics. So how many of you remember Alizon? Come on, who, who remembers Alizon, right? Who remembers that geneticist standing up in front of you and saying, if I can just get Alizon from seven fish, I can tell you everything there is to know about the universe. Remember that? And all we need is $500,000 for some weird gadget that did it. And then a few years later, the same geneticist came and said, well, Alizon didn't actually work. Uh, but don't worry, mitochondrial DNA, if you just give me seven fish, I can tell you everything uh, all I need is $500,000 for a new machine. And then a few years later, you know, snips and, okay. So there is a certain amount of salesmanship here with close kin genetics, but it's too good to be true, okay? And so uh, we need to design the next generation of stock assessment models that can incorporate the types of data that you are getting from uh, close kin genetics. Now, close kin genetics are not going to be used for every single species out there. Uh, but if this method lives up to the promise, this is the holy grail. Um, I'll take the holy grail over a stock assessment anyway. I'm pretty sure I can retire if I have the holy grail. Um, so one of the things about close kin genetics is not only can you get estimates of abundance, as you would from a tagging experiment, but uh, you get all these other cool stuff. Uh, anyone want an estimate of natural mortality? I think that sounds pretty good to me. I'm not sure about fecundity personally, but if you're gonna, if, if, if that comes free as part of the, 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 the gift of natural mortality, I'll take it. Um, there are some complexities. This is not a simple method. There are, guys, how many people do you think in the world you'd let loose on close kin genetics? Probably in single figures still. Hans says single figures. There's more than 10 people in the room that think they can do close kin genetics. You're gonna point out who you don't think is good enough? Don't worry. Um, it is a very technical subject. It's not something that's in the mainstream yet. Um, I'd like a motion from this room that Mark Bravington finally published what he's been do promising to publish for the last couple of decades, but that's a different story for a different day. Um, if you just take the results of closed kin genetics, you could use them as time series of est estimates of abundance. Unfortunately, they're not independent. Most of our stock assessments, if not all of them, assume 
that the, the abundance data are independent estimates of abundance. Robin, please don't tell Mark I just said that because he really doesn't like it when I say that. Um, having said that, Mark, tough. Um, Mark, I, I love this quote, um, Mark Ravington, uh, all we have to do is apparently, this does involve much, does not, inv does not involve much more than some algebra and a few loops, right? But my, um, do you remember that? Fermat's last theorem, it's, it's, it's fairly long, but it doesn't quite fit in the margin of a book. My worry is this, we'll call this Bravington's uh, last theorem or maybe first theorem. Um, it may not be quite as simple as Mark is making out, but it is the future. Um, so close kin has been used for various uh, methods, but of course, Mark recapture generally. I think we're underutilizing those data when we can. Um, I think Multifan is probably doing the best job with tagging data, and I think a little bit of getting together and seeing what people are doing in terms of tagging would be a good thing. Moving on to uh, simulations and MSEs. Um, MSC and simulate, simulation essentially is essential to any new method. If your method doesn't work with simulated data, um, it's probably not going to work with real data. It's just one of those things. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of what we've learned in the last decades have been because we've simulation tested things and found that there are inherent biases that we need to account for. Uh, and of course, MSC is, uh, I mean, I remember when MSC was, I remember when we invented the term, which is sort of scary, um, it's become state of the art. Yet, um, in general, it's not in, as integrated into our stock assessment platforms as it perhaps should be. Um, so pretty clear, uh, I think our new assessment platforms must be able to generate data. Um, and if you're gonna do MSC, it needs to do it properly. Um, and I'll explain about what properly means in a moment. Um, so uh, the way I see this is as we design our software, uh, we should be making sure that the assessment can produce pseudo data sets based on the fits to data. Um, from an MSC point of view, I'd like to see software essentially generating uh, child processes in order to uh, run harvest strategies that are different from the operating model. So Ernesto, I was really upset when I saw your title yesterday and really pleased when I heard what you were doing. Uh, because essentially this is the sort of framework we need to be able to pull together. We need to make sure that we can do these MSCs and do them as efficiently as possible, but not to the point where we assume that the, uh, the uh, assessment scientist actually knows the correct model, because it turns out that's probably not totally correct. Um, and, and in order to facilitate um, uh, testing of, of different methods, I think it would be in our interest to, and I think Ernesto, this is pretty much what you were saying as well, having ways to move data or data and model output between platforms so that you can feed them into something like uh, what we heard about on the A4A framework. So as we develop our new packages, making sure that you get input and output in a way that you can essentially exchange between the multi-fan folks, the stock synthesis folks. Um, so if you are gonna do this, uh, there are a number of sources of uncertainty that you need to put in. Uh, I'm a very grumpy guy about what's called MSE light. Um, so I'm an editor of fisheries research. I suggest you don't submit any papers doing this to me because that's not going to get accepted. So 20 years ago, it was sort of okay to say that your stock assessment could be simulated by taking the true biomass and adding some error to it. I did that. Come on, admit who else did it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Don't do that. We don't have to, and it's wrong. Okay. Okay, let's get technical. Um, so, the, the, oh, okay. Anyone under the age of 50? This is called a punch card. Okay. Uh, this, and in fact, I'm told this is. Sorry? Oh, okay. It was in Fortran, though. Cassette tapes, does anyone, did anyone remember storing data on cassette tapes? You could actually play your music or just listen to your software. Um, um, I think I've really talked about most of this. Uh, essentially, uh, we really should be thinking about dealing with our, uh, our random effects correctly. Um, I think this is gonna be dealt with by others as well. 
uh, one of the challenges with everything I've just said is uh, our N matrix is going to get big, right? So every time we can start, you know, if you just have numbers by year and age, eh, that's a matrix. Putting in sets, that's an array. Putting in area, eh, that's now going to be a four dimensional array. And if you try to visualize it, you go mad. Um, and as we build in other things, for example, in crab assessments, we often keep track of immature and mature uh, populations separately. So they're a separate partition. Uh, in same assessments, we model whether the, sh the shell of the animal is new or old. And you can keep doing this forever. You really don't want an end matrix with 20 dimensions. Um, and so hopefully this is something that Nick is going to tell us about. Essentially, how can we design a model uh, that doesn't have uh, a, a really fixed matrix structure. Um, we need to have this as flexible as possible. I don't want to have to declare a 20 dimensional matrix if I can possibly help it. Uh, so thinking about how to build a model that's scalable between an NYA and an NYA comma B comma C comma D. Um, so this is my, my quiz question. Um, uh, who are these people and how do they relate to stock assets? So it ends your numbers of age matrix. Who is that and who is that? Sorry? On the right. No, it's Q. That's M. Ah, you know, youngsters of today. He, he did stop being M in 1979. So, you know. Anyway, I thought it was too easy if I gave a modern M. Anyway, M and Q are going to have to be time varying. That's why I put them up. Uh, and if you've ever watched James Bond, you will find that M and Q are in fact time varying. So that, that's empirical evidence that M and Q are not constants. Okay, so I'm going to go through the rest of this relatively quickly. Um, uh, I think I've talked a little bit about this one already. Um, and we can come back during question time to, to specifics if anyone's interested. Uh, so things that I think we need to think about. The first one is this business of uh, generic harvest control rules and how we use them. Um, as I say, that's been a, uh, a, a real issue, uh, even with the single species stuff. Once you get into multi-species harvest control rules, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago uh, where I think I came up with 25 definitions of multi-species MSY. So even, when we, even though we don't do multi-species assessments, if we did do multi-species assessments, Jim, you're going to talk about that, right? A little bit. Um, I don't think we know what to do with the answers at this point because we really haven't got a policy framework that deals with multi-species biological rather than technical interactions. Um, I think I've talked about this already as well. Uh, building uh, more complicated likelihood functions, that was in your, your list of questions, uh, and in particular correlations between um, indices. Uh, I like the idea of parameterizing models in terms of leading parameters, things that are actually easy to specify, much as I love steepness. Um, we talked, uh, we heard about yesterday improving MCMC performance by parallelizing, parallelizing. Um, can we do that? Can we avoid the six weeks before the non-convergence? Can we get non-convergence overnight? Wow, wouldn't that be amazing to know how bad we were quickly? Um, when to dispense with fleet areas as fleets, right? I think areas as fleets, it's time has come. It's time to move on to things that actually are more realistic. Uh, selectivity, I think we'll hear a bit about that as well. Um, I think we can, we, uh, this is part of Sam, right? You've got uh, random effects and selectivity. Uh, fixed, separable selectivity was great in its day. Uh, we, can, we can do better. Uh, dynamic reference points, everybody knows the world is changing. Uh, we need to be able to calculate uh, what, is a di what is dynamic MSC. Uh, a lot of legislation today refers to, we want you to manage to our current MSY, right? What is that? Apart from not knowing what that actually means, um, we need to be able to calculate it if we knew what it means. Uh, parameterizing models, uh, I think, still think we're not doing a good job. Um, I can't, the number of people yesterday that made nice comments about R for SS, I think I have to echo that. I think R for SS has been a wonderful platform for developing uh, diagnostics in a way that makes it worthwhile. So if I create a really fancy diagnostic to look at my model fit and I'm the only person who uses it, it's pretty much a waste of time. But if I give it to Ian and then thousands of people ignore it, I feel that I could have made a difference, but I didn't. 
Um, and I really do think we need to think about that in the context of common output files. So basically, R for SS or R for the universe um, would be a way to look at output in multifan, SS, SAM, gadget, etc. So we're really using the community as developers instead of just all those SS nodes. Stock root relationships, partitions, all good stuff. I want to talk a little bit of size structured models. Um, I think we're, we're way behind in terms of size structured models. Um, so I, I'm involved probably more with crustaceans than I am with fish these days. And the ratio of uh, packaged conducted stock assessments of size structured models relative to uh, PDOs is unbelievable. Most of the assessments of uh, crustaceans are done with models that have been written by uh, individual authors that might get used in two or three assessments, but that's pretty unusual. And so I, I think we need an effort to unify our size structured models. Uh, they actually do very similar things, uh, but they, for whatever reason, people who work with abalones and, and things like that don't communicate. Um, the other thing about invertebrates that we haven't touched on is the extreme spatial variation. So I am not going to take soft synthesis and apply it to an abalone, because as John Annalyn knows, I'll need 413 spatial areas with almost no data for each, right? Okay, there is extreme spatial variation for some of these animals. How do we deal with that? Uh, and that sort of relates to the whole, what do we do with things like clines, which are in the same dimension of problems? So I'm gonna do a little review because I'm an academic. I've got to grade people, that's what I do. Um, so is this the model you want? So this is dedicated to Maya, who needs her Lord of the Rings fix on a daily basis. So that is the ring that rules them all, right? Do we want this? Can anyone remember the Lord of the Rings? This is New Zealand, you've got to have Lord of the Rings. It's sort of obligatory. Um, so if you, if you go for the, the ring of power, what you might end up with is that guy, right? That's, he's the owner of the ring of power. You might not want the, the uh, uh, Sauron version of Rick Mathot. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm still of the belief that multiple parallel efforts are beneficial. I think we, as scientists, we do our best work when we're sitting and fiddling around with models. I do think the community really does need to work together better. I feel pretty, I, I feel I know enough about stock synthesis to criticize it and I have read the SAM code it's nice and short so I can feel I can criticize it um, but I've never seen all of the castle code and multi-fan of course they, they actually take one of your fingers if you get the code uh, and they don't return it it turns out um, just be aware of that um, so I think we as a, a, a community really do need to talk more and, and I again I just have to make someone feel bad uh, Rich uh, what was the score again what, what happened the good news is you came second. You know what that counts for? Nothing. Okay, I didn't put New Zealand up here because I, I wanted to actually leave the country alive. <laughs> okay, so uh, where are we in terms of uh, who, who are in the, who, which models are in the final and, and which one actually comes out with the, the cup? So I really focused on only a small number of the models. There are a lot of models. I've excluded my own models here. I, I think they're the interesting thing that comes out in this comparison is A, I probably got it wrong, um, and feel free to criticize me, I'll ignore you, it's, it's fine, I can do that. Um, there, there are models that, every model has a feature that is pretty good, and there's no model that wins on every category. So, um, some of the models, Gadget actually does really well in terms of features, but falls over on a, another criteria later on. So, if you look through this list of what's in and what's out, um, so for those who don't know, SS, stock synthesis, gadget, gadget, Poseidon, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Multifan, Castle, GMAX, which is a, a size structured model for crab stocks that uh, Jim and I have worked on. But what you see is that every model can do some of it. Stock synthesis can actually usually attempt to deal with these things in a, in a sort of manner. It, it can cover it, but it's, it's clearly not optimal. Random effects uh, or Bayesian methods, most of these models are are random, uh, the ex uh, sorry, are Bayesian. The exception here is Sam, which is probably the only model along with uh, we, w w Wickham, William, what do we pronounce? how do you pronounce that? Wham! You do realize that's George Michael? You might want to think about that name. 
wake me up before my assessment goes? I don't know, it's like, I'm not going there. Um, uh, biological interactions, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, I think when Jim gives his presentation, we'll hear about Seattle, which is about the only multi-species biological integrated model that's in a, in a easy to get hold of, semi easy to get hold of environment. Um, I was really a little concerned here, close to genetics, there is nothing. You've literally got to go and talk to Hans, Rich, Robin, and the other three people in the world who know what they're talking about. Most of the models can do simulations. Uh, I am not completely convinced I agree that all of the models pass the MSC test, but we'll be nice. Um, so how do the, in, in the final evaluation, or close to final evaluation, um, the big five, um, but I only had four models, so I couldn't, I don't think there is a big four. Um, so synthesis, synthesis, lots of options. Uh, I think we've heard about access to the code um, and uh, how publicly available that is, how easy it is to modify. Um, the random effect structure in synthesis is clearly not there. Uh, it's Bayesian only. Gadget is fantastic. It's got everything you've ever wanted. It is really slow. Um, it comes in three speeds, slow, very slow, and just doesn't get anywhere at all. So uh, I, I think Gadget probably holds the structure. In terms of features, it seems to have about as many as we want, but we need to meet, move, move the code into the 21st century. Um, and I'm sure Bjarke will tell us his experience. Castle is awesome. Uh, also a lot of options. Uh, I didn't hear much about random effects. The, the New Zealand world is, is highly Bayesian. Um, it's not clear to me that it actually runs right now, which I would suggest is something we need to worry about. Uh, Multifan, uh, again, source code issues, really strong in the spatial dimension, but I'm sure we'll hear more about that. My recollection is it's pretty damn slow, at least it was when I reviewed uh, Big Eye. Really cool that you can go out and drink while these guys are running their models, but not so good if you want to run it during a meeting. Some final thoughts. I think we covered a lot of this yesterday. Uh, whatever we do, we need to make sure our packages are maintained and documented. They need to be efficient, um, not just efficient computationally, but efficient statistically as well. Um, I think one of the issues we really need to think about is gatekeepers. Um, as someone who reviews a lot of assessments, if someone comes into a meeting and says, Rick just gave me a new option and it's gonna solve all my problems, I have my bug index is about 0.95. Chances of a bug if it's the first time it's been used, don't, don't be that person. Never be the person to use an option in SOC synthesis for the first time because it's almost certainly wrong. Um, and <laughs> It's, hey, I got data. Some data, not long. Anyway, um, uh, the other thing is, I, I think for the broader community, and here I'm thinking not just this group, but people who do have to do assessments, and our, for example, our, our Japanese colleagues who have to do, was it 200 assessments in an hour and a half or something? Um, and uh, we heard from Queensland needs to do 57 assessments in seven years. And I've, I've met all the people who are going to do them. Good luck for that. I hope you don't need leave because you're not going to be taking vacation for a long time. Uh, so having the ability to construct pro formas for sort of vanilla assessments, I think would be really helpful instead of having to learn the gadget input file or the castle input file, much as I love the castle input file. Final, final thought. Um, Gadget is probably the only of, of the packages it do, that does biological interactions, so predation between multiple species. Um, it doesn't fit the diet data, it does now. Okay, it didn't when I talked last time. So it actually can fit diet data? Oh, well, someone lied to me. Um, so ignore that. Um, um, and then there's Seattle. So I think there's features in Gadget we should want to learn about because none of our other models are there yet. Uh, MICE models are really popular, models of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessment. Um, they are totally bespoke. Every model is different. Um, and we need to really think about what that means for our world. Um, okay. Um, one important... Oh, I thought he was getting up to throw me down, but there we go. Okay, um, I'm nearly, I should have 10 minutes for questions. Um, I don't. Uh, I know. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've discovered, and I'm sure Rick can confirm, is the number of times people have said, oh, oh, we're stuck, this could do X. And then you 
you say, well, actually, if you happen to know that is it the link, the, the, the environmental link in stock synthesis on what's it, 101 does something. It's like there are things in synthesis that you you know you actually have to give up your firstborn child and they will tell you what the secret is. Sorry? Yeah, and, and occasionally it's right. <laughs> Chantel, how many, how many updates did you make? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but what I guess I'm saying is I think a lot of the issues with uh, the packages is these things are really getting really complicated and effective training and, and things like CAPM I think are, are really important for that. So at that point I will stop. Um, I've decided that today I'm, I would be teaching right now so I, I just need to, to grade you. So you can only ask me a question if you can identify a person. Uh, and you're not allowed to choose Rick, Ray, Hillborn, Mark Maunder, the group down here. You've got to choose one of the other people and then you can ask me a question. Okay, thank you. Okay, we, we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone want to? Patrick. So who are you going to identify? Okay, so Terry Quinn's over here, like Terry yeah. Quinn, you may, you may proceed. Okay, thank you. You didn't say anything about ensemble modeling capability, so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. I, I tend to see those as more post-model integration, so rather than running multiple models in, in parallel, which you sort of, you know, you could imagine, uh, I mean, we run true multi-model ensembles and things like uh, reversible jump MCMCs and stuff like that. But I, I tend to see, you know, can we run multiple models, hopefully using the same data, then post-integrate to, to create an ensemble rather than try to build a model that automatically does ensemble model. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to work out how to do that. And is that a good idea? I mean, the concept. I, I think uh, it is. I think the one, obviously, one of the challenges is how to weight different models, right? Um, it's just a new version of the consultant coming to the council and saying, I did another model, use it, basically. So we need to, we need to know what we're going to do with the answer. In some cases, it's straightforward, like I've got two stock crucial relationships I want to integrate, that's fine. But once we're integrating like different data sources, and it, 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 there, there are a number of dragons there that we have read yet to fully confront. Okay, anyone else got a question? Jim? Who, who, who are you going to select? Uh, do I have to go with dead people? Yeah, sorry, dead people. Uh, Ram. Okay, you, you may proceed. Um, These are all very easy people to get, you know that. I, I guess just your comment yesterday about wanting to have tools and your comment today about killing ADMB. You're not getting a t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the proliferation of students and people who are using packages only for their research. And I guess, I guess it links to the question about do scientists need to have programming tools to use to evaluate fisheries data outside of packages? And obviously you and I love to do our own tools and work and I agreed completely with your comment. Um, and I guess I'm, what I'm getting to is like, if someone's in school right now, they're expert at stock synthesis, say, or whatever, um, and they want to do their own thing, I know some people might be intimidated by TMB just because it's a little bit more difficult to get in. And I just wonder if there's, you know, tools that are not that hard to learn. There's fundamental concepts that I think are somewhat easier in AD Model Builder than TMB. Um, you know, I, well, firstly, you know, if you're a student, you, I mean, I, I've, I, I believe every time I start my class, I say something like, you shouldn't use a package unless you can program it yourself. Right now, you may not program it efficiently, but you should know what, basically, if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't be allowed to push the big red button. That's, you know, that's, that's my bottom line. So all my, I mean, Chantel, didn't I make you essentially program the guts of stock synthesis during your thesis? So she understands how the guts work because she wasn't allowed to do a thesis until she understood what it was she was doing. So, you know, fundamentally, we still need programmers. We still need to have research models. I find that teaching students starting with R is actually a really good idea because it's intuitive. Um, all our students have to learn R now. 
Uh, sometimes teaching in Excel, particularly with age structure models, is really good. But like most things, it's how to wean people off to the next generation. I'm, I, I, I've taught ADMB and TMB for quite a long time. I didn't get the sense that, <coughs> Maya, you can comment. I didn't get the sense that students really struggled a lot more with ADMB, TMB than ADMB. The, for you and I, the error message that mean nothing, we know what those mean now, right? But for a new student, an incomprehensible TMB error message and an incomprehensible ADMB message are really pretty similar. Um, Maya, you agree? Yeah. You've got, a, got your general exam coming soon, so agree. Yeah. John. John. Yep. Yeah. Give me, give me a hard one. I think I see Fournier up the top. Oh no, you can't have him. No? Okay, uh, Gullen. Gullen. Who's okay? Thank you. I was hoping someone was here. John Gullen claims to have crashed more stocks in his career than any other fisheries scientist. He was the guy who invented the idea of MSY equals half MV zero. Remember that method that he doesn't use anymore? Um, it apparently doesn't work so well. But if you're, if you're a follow-up, you might as well be the best as ever be. Yes, John. Yeah, so on the code thing for multi-fancy, I actually just looked at the website, and it says it is available. So it says it's not currently available for downloading, but we're happy to provide the source code to serious users for development, <laughs> for development and learning. Contact the multi-fancyl development team if you fall into this category. So. <laughs> um, in terms of the speed, though, um, I, I think it, it, it obviously depends on the size of the model that you're that you're using. That big eye model, you know, it's calculating seven thousand derivatives yep. or whatever it's doing, so it's slow. If you do oceanic white tip, it's just like that. Fair point. Okay, um, we run out of time, so okay. um, either talk to Andre during the break or. Um, at the end of the day, we'll have a uh, discussion session. Yep. And, we should move on.